The 21st Sunday after Trinity, the Collect. Let us pray. Grant, we beseech thee, merciful Lord, to thy faithful people, pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve thee with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The epistle is written in the sixth chapter of the epistle of St. Paul, the apostle to the Ephesians, beginning with the 10th verse. My brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Here endeth the epistle. The Holy Gospel is written in the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning with the 46th verse. There was a certain nobleman, whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son live. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The epistle and gospel readings today are about as straightforward as lessons go. As is often the case, the epistle reading reinforces the message given to us in the gospel lesson. Today, we are confronted with a story about faith. This goes far beyond the rather mundane form of modern faith we Christians expect of ourselves. Before I go any further, I'll attempt to explain that a bit. In the modern world, especially the Western world, we live comfortable lives, especially by the standard of biblical characters. Our lives are, thankfully, 
fairly mundane. We have the blessing to live lives filled with little excitement, the kind of excitement that's not fun, which is to say our life, liberty, and property are generally secure. This was not the case for those residing during the time of Christ. The Jewish people lived in a state of military occupation. Life, already fragile enough, appeared even more fragile during these times. Medicine was more a spiritual and magical enterprise. Biblical characters were beholden to nature, to violence, to chaos. This, then, made their displays of faith far more dangerous. St. Paul calls the Philippians to put on the whole armor of God. He says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and have done all, stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to acquench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. While St. Paul explicitly mentions faith as one aspect of the whole armor of God, it remains true that the whole armor of God is in fact faith itself. We are called to truth, righteousness, a commandment to live in peace, and to live in the knowledge of our salvation. This is, in its totality, a call to faith in Christ. Earlier in the passage, St. Paul describes the various entities we are called to do battle with. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. St. Paul contends that it is the weapon of faith, comprised of these various pieces of armor and weaponry with which we are to do battle. But who and what is he calling us to resist? Broadly speaking, he is calling us to resist the spirit of evil that infects the world through sin. The spirit of evil is made manifest in many different ways. There is, of course, the spiritual reality of this conflict. We are called to resist Satan and his companions. While this might sound like the start of a comic book movie or an exorcism film, it is, in fact, a reality. It was a reality in the time of Jesus, and it is a reality today. It is, however, and thankfully, a far more uncommon thing than one might be led to believe. Most of us will, thankfully, live our lives without having to acknowledge and participate in such a brutally violent reality as is depicted in various Hollywood exaggerations of possession. Despite this fact, every single one of us will come into conflict with the repercussions of the spirit of evil present in our world. Violence, hunger, disease, war, terrorism, greed. Each of these is a product of the wiles of the devil. As St. Paul tells us, it is our responsibility, therefore, as good Christians, to stand strong in our faith. As Father Hart told us last week, the will of God is made plain through his scripture. It is tangible and it is verifiable. We are called to faith with this truth and this righteousness to stand in opposition to the evil of this world. However, it is made manifest. Sometimes this is made manifest through government. Sometimes it is made so through corporate greed. 
Sometimes this spirit of evil is made manifest through our interpersonal relationships. We must stand vigilant. We must stand in the truth. We must stand through faith. As anyone with small children knows, it is almost Halloween. Halloween is a long-observed Christian holiday wherein we recognize and celebrate the Christian men, women, children, and saints that preceded us. The secular culture has added its own twist to the Christian holiday that includes trick-or-treating, dressing up in costumes, and my personal favorite, scary movies. Admittedly, most of these films carry very little moral or religious value. Indeed, there are many that I think obscene and perhaps even harmful to our spiritual welfare. But there is the rare few that carry significant messages, if not flawed theology. One of my favorites is an exorcism movie entitled The Right, starring Anthony Hopkins. Some of you may have seen it. Anyone? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, good. I'm glad to know that I'm somebody knows what I'm talking about. Sir Anthony Hopkins plays an elderly exorcist in Rome. He receives a visit from a much younger priest who is studying to become an exorcist himself. Unfortunately, however, this young priest has lost his faith. And while studying to be an exorcist is also wrestling with his own personal unbelief. Not, I would say, a great position to be in. The story unfolds with Anthony Hopkins' character becoming possessed. In the end, the demon inhabiting him demands to know if the young priest believes in the devil. Up until that point, the in the exorcism, the young priest was performing seemed to have very little effect. In this climactic scene, the young priest admits that after what he has seen, he does indeed believe in the devil. But he doesn't end his admission there. He approaches the possessed man, gets right in his face, and says, if the devil is real, that means God is real too. Almost immediately, the rite of exorcism becomes effective and Anthony Hopkins is relieved of the possessing demon. While dramatic and certainly helpful, that is not how exorcism actually works. The priest has no power in an exorcism. The rite itself has no power over the demon. It is Christ who commands the demon. It does, however, carry a valuable message. Faith is power. Faith gives our very breath meaning. Faith always provides the answer to the question of why. The words the priest used possessed little power without faith. It is only once the priest truly believed that suddenly his words possessed power over the demonic foe. This story contains a vivid and significant display of the power of faith. The Gospel lesson tells us yet another story of faith. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And he believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. In this story, Jesus challenges the man requesting help. He basically tells the gentleman that he has no faith in Christ's divinity, and accuses him of needing to see miracles in order to believe. We should, as good Christians, be always, always be suspect of new people claiming divine status or divine revelation. In being suspect, we should properly turn to Scripture to decipher its truth. All things divine, that is to say, all things of the Spirit, complement the will of God as contained in Scripture. 
this nobleman stood tall in his faith. He stood, as St. Paul would say, girded in the truth and righteousness, and he recognized Jesus as the fulfillment of that which preceded him. He was not offended by Christ's challenge. He did not, in turn, challenge Christ for his statement. Instead, he reiterated his request, and in so doing, demonstrated his significant faith. As a result, Christ recognized and rewarded this faith. We are called to live a life of faith. This faith is a faith in the will of God, and the will of God is objectively given to us through the person of Jesus Christ and the Holy Scriptures. Truth and righteousness are recognizable in our world, and they are indeed verifiable as such in Scripture. We must put on the whole armor of God and plant ourselves firmly on this foundation of faith. It does not end with proper theology. It does not end with our personal relationships. No, this foundation of faith transcends all religious, political, and social barriers. It is relevant at all times and in all places. Faith is a powerful tool, and it gives all our thoughts, words, and actions substance. Without it, we live a meaningless existence, but with it, we carry the light of Christ's salvation to the world. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost be ascribed as is most justly due all honor, power, might, majesty, and dominion henceforth, world without end. Amen. Amen.